On Friday, September 28th, the Norris Group proudly presents its 11th annual award-winning black tie event, I Survived Real Estate. An incredible lineup of industry experts will join Bruce Norris to discuss perplexing industry trends, head-scratching legislation, tech disruption, and opportunities emerging for real estate professionals. All proceeds from the event benefit Make-A-Wish and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This event is not possible without the generous help of the following platinum partners. The San Diego Creative Real Estate Investors Association, Invest Club, Inland Empire Real Estate Investment Club, Think Realty, Wilson Investment Properties, Coach Fullerton, First Lending Solutions, Property Radar, The Apartment Owners Association, MVT Productions, and Realty 411. Visit isurvivedrealestate.com for event information and see Amazon Prime or YouTube for past events. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Dr. Christopher Thornburg. Dr. Thornburg founded Beacon Economics LLC in 2006. Under his leadership, the firm has become one of the most respected research organizations in California, serving public and private sector clients across the United States. In 2015, Dr. Thornburg also became director of the UC Riverside School of Business Center for Economic Forecasting and Development and an adjunct professor at the school. He's an expert in economic and revenue forecasting, regional economics, economic policy, and labor and real estate markets, and consults for private industry, cities, counties, and public agencies. Dr. Thornburg became nationally known for forecasting the subprime mortgage market crash that began in 2007 and was one of the few economists on record to predict the global economic recession that followed. Dr. Thornburg, we welcome you back to our show. Nice to be here. Lots of interesting stuff going on. So the first question I had for you is the end of quantitative easing and the Fed uh, reducing its balance sheet. What's the impact on the economy? Um, probably one of the largest impacts is how it is reducing inflation, which I know is an odd thing to say because every time you pick up uh, the newspaper or go online, I should say, to read the newspaper, uh, almost assuredly you're seeing yet another commentator talk about how inflation is this uh, hugely important negative impact in our uh, in our economy today. When the reality is, uh, when you look at the Fed reversing its its actions, getting rid of that balance sheet, you've watched money supply growth shrink to really the lowest it has been since the middle of the Great Recession. Uh, This is broadly deflationary, particularly when combined with relatively slow bank lending. Um, And, of course, it flies in the face of Fed policy. Uh, The Fed is responding as if inflation is a given and has been, of course, hiking rates along with shrinking its balance sheet. So it's a it's an interesting place we're in. Um, have we ever? We, I don't think we've ever been here before, actually. Uh, well, uh, not not in recent history. Certainly, we've never had such pervasive uh, lack of inflationary pressures in the U.S. economy. I don't want to say deflationary completely, but but we are truly in a low inflation rate regime, and uh, it is absolutely an issue for Fed policy. But the Fed doesn't seem to care. Um, in fact, when we think about what the Fed is doing, uh, hiking short-term rates, pushing that federal funds rate up, flattening the yield curve, uh, I would argue that, uh, yet again, it's a reflection of the peculiarity of our economy today, which is our policymakers running around solving problems that don't actually exist, and in the process, uh, potentially doing more harm to the economy uh, than good. And I think that the Fed is is one of many examples of that. Do you see the 4.1 quarterly GDP growth as giving them more permission to raise rates? <laughs> no, because the 4.1 percent increase was largely driven by the fiscal stimulus plan that was put in place at the end of last year. Um, you saw, of course, personal and corporate taxes being cut pretty sharply, along with an increase in government spending. The strong growth in business investment, the strong growth in consumer spending, 
the strong growth in government spending were all a result of that fiscal stimulus. Now, remember the other side of this. Um, if you're going to tax less and spend more, that money has to come from borrowing. And, of course, that's exactly what we see the federal government do. They have been sharply increasing their borrowing. And it goes back to the, just the, the sheer hypocrisy of, of, of politics today. Of course, when Obama was running deficits, the Republicans were just screaming bloody murder uh, regarded, uh, about it. Uh, the end of the world. We're pushing the U.S. economy to a fiscal crisis. We're going to be just like Europe and mired in a massive debt failure. And here the Republicans are actually doing it even worse because as whereas Obama was borrowing all this money in the context of trying to help a healing economy, uh, the Republicans are doing it in the context of a full employment economy. There's no reason to be using fiscal stimulus. Remember, ultimately, fiscal stimulus, it feels good today, but all that money has to get paid back, and that means through less spending and higher taxes tomorrow. We're simply mortgaging our future for this 4.1% growth rate today, and to me, that's not good fiscal policy. What do you, what do you, where do you see GDP growth for 2019? Uh, I think it's still going to be solid. We'll probably be in the 25 to 3% range. I mean, the thing about fiscal stimulus is it gives you a short-term boost, but then it kind of fades off. But the underlying fundamentals are still there. Um, you know, people keep asking when the next recession is going to be. We are now in the midst of the second longest expansion in U.S. economic history. Um, but that by itself doesn't tell you much. In fact, uh, the idea that counting months is a good way of predicting the next recession <laughs> is a little bit off-putting, to yeah. say the least. It's not how it works. Um basically every recession has to be caused by some sort of shock to the system. And to date, we have yet to see something that would rise to that level. That is to say something that could really push the economy off the growth path it is currently on. Now they're trying. Um, if we see a continued expansion of the trade war, if we continue to see the Fed push rates up to the point where they flip the yield curve, um, you could end up in a position where we can start thinking about the end of this particular expansion, but we're not there yet. Okay, an inverted yield curve. So you're a, you're a believer that if that occurs, then we probably, the likelihood of a recession increases. Is that correct? No. Um, <laughs> okay. I wouldn't say that. Okay. Uh, and I wouldn't say it largely because we don't really know the answer to that. Here, here's, here's the two sides of it. The first side is, Every, every one of the last nine recessions was preceded by an inverted yield curve. So it is probably one of the strongest indicators that we are about to go into a downturn. However, um, causation and correlation are different things. That's correlation I just gave you. There are typically other issues at play. The Federal Reserve is typically responding to some sort of growing imbalance inside the economy. The net result of which they are pushing rates up to try and cool things off and thus inverting the yield curve. So in a sense, it's a, a symptom more of an other underlying problem rather than necessarily a problem in itself. So it isn't necessarily a certainty that we will have a recession, but I would say it's also not clear that we wouldn't have a recession. So it's, it's just yet another stressor or something to keep an eye on. It isn't clear exactly how it would end up permeating itself inside the economy, if that makes any sense. One of the problems with an inverted yield curve at these levels, that would be a first. So last time we inverted it over 6%, uh, something around 8% the time before that, and this might invert below 3 So what... What tools would the Fed have to, that they normally do? They normally reduce the the low the short term rate quite a bit, four or five points. Right. And this time they wouldn't right. have that ammunition. Exactly. So so you do exactly what they did last time around, which is go back to quantitative easing. Um, you know, remember that the point of Fed policy is to get money into the system, and there's three ways of doing that. The first way is to cut the federal funds rate which makes it cheaper for banks to borrow, which makes bank, banks willing to expand their balance sheet. 
But that only works in as much as, as banks are willing to lend more, which can be stymied by both banks' natural inclination to be risk adverse and, of course, current policy regarding lending standards. If, as a result of the failure of federal fund rate, because you can't push it down any lower because you can't get the banks to lend that much more, another way of doing it is to just run around and start buying bonds. You could initially buy bonds from banks, or you could buy bonds on the open market, paying people cash for it. Again, that injects cash into the system, which is considered to be broadly stimulative in the short run. And if that doesn't work, um, the last system, one we've never used, but could be used. In fact, uh, Ben Bernanke, back at the beginning of his turn, talked about this. He, he talked about, you know, uh, worst case scenario, you can you can fly around in helicopters and throw hundred dollar bills off the window. Right. <laughs> it, uh, because that's why he, he had the nickname Helicopter Ben for a long time because of that. Now, mind you, they probably wouldn't fly helicopters around and throw hundred dollar bills out. It would create uh, utter chaos on the ground. But <laughs> imagine that the Federal Reserve simply mailed everybody in the United States a two hundred dollar check. Here you go. Have fun. Um, that would that would work, right? Um, so, and they could. They have the wherewithal to do that. Remember, they control the money supply, so they can print up whatever they want and, and send it out. They've never done that before, but it, it could be done. So they have tools. We don't have to have to reload the gun, so to speak. That's that's not true. Okay. Do you see a chance of negative interest rates? Um, not not in the short end. No. I mean, you know, you saw that happening in Germany at the long end. But you know, candy. Look, long long run rates have been drifting up lately. I mean, um, they are ten year bond is running around three percent, um, and that's a perfectly reasonable number, given that. Um, you have uh, you, you, you think about that. It, it's because of the faster growing economy we're seeing, right? The last time interest rates were running about three percent was back in 2014, when the U.S. economy was growing at a similar clip to what it is now, when the global economy was growing at a similar clip to what it's doing now. So I don't see rates going into that territory. We have a strong enough economy. There is enough demand for this for money. Um, that rates are going to stay in positive territory. Well, you just mentioned a 3% 10 year. So we have a 3% 10 year, a 4% GDP growth, or let's say we have two and a half and three uh, uh, annually, and we have uh, basically full employment. Has the 10 year ever been at 3% with full employment? And uh, I'm sure back in, back in the 50s, 60s. Okay, but that's very unusual. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been a while, sure. Well, but isn't that telling? Yeah, I mean, you got to remember, it's it's been a while simply because we had the high inflation seventies and eighties. But really, what we are is returning to to in some levels, some a degree of historic norm. Um, are you concerned about deflation? You mentioned that, and what what would cause that? Um, well, again, a continued um, a collapse of the money supply would basically end up being deflationary for the economy. Now, mind you, deflation is at best a short-term problem. Worst-case scenario is they can start printing money, and and that's it. No more deflation. So, deflation to me is not um, any sort of a uh, a critical issue for the U.S. economy. It's it manageable, as the case may be. Do you have a an opinion of what causes the next recession? Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's as simple as that. I'm, I'm waiting and to watching to see what's going on. But the debt market seem okay. Real estate market seem okay. I'm a little worried about Federal Reserve policy. I'm a little worried about about the uh, uh, potential for a massive trade shock because of ongoing trade concerns. Although now that they have announced some sort of negotiation with Europe, it looks like that may be fading away. A unilateral trade battle with China will not will not push us over the edge. Uh, that would have to be really a global trade battle. Um, and, and again, this the fact that they're basically backing off on Europe and, and talking again to Europe about some trade negotiation, which, which mind you, is, is really a, just a, a, a hysterical irony. I mean, we do have to all appreciate that during the election, um, again, the, the candidate Trump was incredibly negative on the transatlantic trade partnership that was going through. Um, and of course, <laughs> what they'd recently announced was, guess what? 
yet another um, a nod towards uh, transatlantic trade partnership. It's exactly the same thing that the Obama administration was doing. Um, so they demonized it, killed it, created trade shocks, brought it back, claimed it was theirs, and said it's wonderful. Welcome to modern politics, people. I don't enjoy politics at all now. Never probably did, but I, I despise them at this point, to be honest with you, and I pay very little. Oh, it, it, it's just, it's so, it's so horrendous. And, you know, I realize that listeners may want to paint me as a, a Democrat or a Republican as a result of me saying that, uh, but I would note that it's really not about being a Democrat or Republican. It's just amazing to me how how politics in this day and age have just devolved to this just sheer level of i don't know it, it, it's just crazy it, well, it's, it's very much george orwellian um what's going on out there today i i end every i survive real estate with asking the panel you know what's like what's her last thought and my my last thought is always that i i want for the for at least the next year for every elected official to act like an american not a democrat or a republican but i know yes. that's completely <laughs> not yes. likely but yes. that's what i wish for and you know i would say that that 30 years ago the democrats and republicans agreed on what the problems were but they would disagree on what the solutions were. Yeah, that's, um, that's, that, that, that's that they had a different policy regarding uh, different different priorities, different philosophies when it came to, to policy. But at least they understood what the problems were. Today, they can't even agree on the, what the problems are. And um, it has we have truly moved into this world of um, just double speak, just political double speak. And like you said, people are far more interested in their party than they are in the nation, and it's very scary. Yeah, I mean, from from day one after election, the it seems like the whole plot is how to win the next election, and it's yeah. forget about trying to accomplish anything. Let's just make the other side look ridiculous, and and you create extremes. So the other side's yeah. extremely one way. Well, then we have to do the opposite, and it's very hard to get something done when you start with that. Uh, scenario. It's and it's very frustrating as an American to watch this because, like you say, there's a lot of important decisions that aren't being made that'll have a big price tag later, and they they're getting bigger instead of smaller, and it's just unfortunate. So, yeah, that's exactly right. Because while they are running around fighting over solutions to problems that don't exist, the really very real problems that do exist, uh, and boy, those are numerous, uh, are getting worse and worse. Uh, you have very real problems with pensions and entitlements. Uh, the government borrowing situation in a decade will become critical. We're not investing in infrastructure. Uh, our tax system is still a complete wreck. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's a scary time, and we just don't seem to have the ability or wherewithal to, to fix it. I mean, that's too bad. The U.S. demographics, um, is that negative or positive for GDP growth? Oh, absolutely negative. Uh, you know, the the boomers were by far and away the biggest generation ever uh, relative to their parents. Uh, I, you know, my, my running joke on this is all, all boomers were raised in a family of approximately 14 kids. <laughs> they were so traumatized by the experience. They all had one and a half kids, which they excessively overparented, thus giving us the millennials. See how that works? Yeah. <laughs> um, but putting all that to one side, what has happened is our GDP, I'm sorry, our population pyramid has turned into a population column. Uh, millennials are the biggest generation ever, uh, but that is only because they are uh, about 2% larger than uh, the um, than the, um, uh, the, the boomers. And uh, if you look at, say, for example, growth in 25 to 54-year-olds, over the course of the last 10 years, uh, it hasn't grown. It's been flat. So we have a real problem on our hands. Um, from a demographic standpoint, we're just not adding enough people to, to, to continue to fill jobs. And that's, uh, that's, that's a problem. It's a problem from a financial perspective because who's going to pay all those bills? Um, it's a problem from a, from an employer's perspective. Hence, we have some of the tightest labor markets ever. And the solution to this, by the way, is clear: uh, more immigrants. Uh, it's very simple. Now, if you want to debate how immigrants come to this country uh, and on what basis—is it family, or is it skills, is it legal, or is it illegal? 
I mean, I'm going to sit down and have that debate as long as we all understand what we're debating is how to increase the number of immigrants coming to this country. Right now, obviously, this administration has an open antipathy and, and, uh, towards immigrants. I said that word wrong, but you know what I mean. Um, very open, very open, hostile, particularly to immigrants of, shall we say, darker shades than the administration. The net result of that, of course, is is that immigration has really been slowing down and it's taking a problem and making it even worse. Now, for your individual worker in the United States, there's an upside to all this, which, of course, is that wages are growing very nicely right now. It's one of the reasons that consumer spending has been nice and strong. Um, so, you know, there is the upside. And businesses will be forced to invest more and more because that'll be that'll be how countries – or companies, excuse me, prosper uh, in this environment. You have to invest in capital in order to increase output and continue to grow your profits. So there are positive sides of it, but it will constrain growth, um, except for, of course, these short-term bursts as created by unnecessary fiscal policy. In innovations like robotics, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, uh, self-driving cars, all that stuff, what's the short-term... Yeah. Is this, what is the short term impact on the economy and is it different well, the, the, is, and is it different fantastic. than is it different than the long <laughs> is it different than the long term impact? No, 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 no. Look, I mean all, all these things you're talking about, first of all, you know, every time you turn around, uh, someone's always screaming the end of the end of work because of because of robotics. I mean, you can go all the way back to the Luddites, remember them? Running around bashing farm machinery in the sixteen hundreds, seventeen hundreds because they were sure that these machines would take all the jobs away from people. Um, you know, the idea that technology causes massive dislocation of people, it's just, it's just not true. We look, look at where we are today with all the information technology running around, the massive increases in productivity and manufacturing, and yet the unemployment rate in the U.S. has never been lower, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's evolution, not revolution. Um, there's nothing particularly unusual about this next wave of innovation. It's just more labor saving innovation. I remember talking to my father once about this and he was quite positive that you know, all these jobs are going to be consumed by capital. And I pointed out to him, you know, there was a point in time when 90% of all jobs in the United States were, was in agri were in agriculture. 90% of people were being used just to feed ourselves. Today, of course, it's about 1%. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter. They're plenty of jobs out there. There's plenty of things for people to do, and that will continue to be. <laughs> right now, <clears throat> given the labor shortages we're seeing as a country, um, these should all be welcome relief. Now, mind you, when the next downturn comes, one of the downsides of this is that labor markets take longer to heal. We've seen this before. It's less of a long-term impact and more of a short-term impact because what it means is when we do have recessions, uh, the bounce back in employment is, is slower than it would have been, say, 20, 30 years ago. So that is an issue. But it's an issue that should be handled by appropriate policy, appropriate policy wrapped around, of course, avoiding the recession in the first place, not allowing the kind of imbalances of tackling problems appropriately. And then, of course, in the context of downturn itself, it's using appropriate fiscal and monetary policy to, to limit the overall impacts. So it can be handled on the other end if we have a responsible government, hence the problem. <laughs> well, Dr. Thornburg, we have run out of time. I hope you get a voice at that level if you if you don't have one already, and uh, maybe you can talk some sense into the group. Appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate, we'll we'll appreciate you joining us very much. Always great to be here, Bruce. Thank you. The Norris Group would like to thank its gold sponsors for supporting I Survived Real Estate. Guaranteed Rate and Nathan Chiboya, In a Day Development, Inland Valley Association of Realtors, Jason Thorman with Coldwell Banker, Jennifer Buys Houses, Keystone CPA, LA South Ria, Las Brisas Escrow, Lawyers Title, Michael Ryan and Associates, New Western, NorCal Ria, NSDREI, Orange County Real Estate Investors, The Outspoken Investor. Pacific Premier Bank, Pasadena Phoebe, Pilot Limousine, SJREI, Spinnaker Loans, South OC RIA, Tri-County Association of Realtors, 
You direct IRA services. White House Catering. See isurvivedrealestate.com for event information. 